Everybody loves a good beef. That extra passion when two people that just don't like each other go head to head. Today's video is all about feeling the hate. Here are the 10 craziest beefs in NFL history. Richard Sherman vs. Michael Crabtree Before we get to this moment, we need to back up a bit. Before the 2014 NFC Championship game, this beef began at a charity event. Yep, Richard Sherman offered Michael Crabtree a handshake before a charity softball game that Crabtree refused. The two went back and forth, but Sherman never got his handshake. Now fast forward to the NFC Championship. The two collided for 60 minutes straight, and it came down to one final meeting in the end zone. Sherman made a clutch deflection while guarding Michael Crabtree, which led to a game-winning pick. Immediately after, he found Crabtree walking off and extended out his hand once more. He still didn't get his handshake. Sherman's epic rant was forever immortalized. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're gonna get. Aaron Andrews' face still makes us laugh to this day. Let's be honest, this beef wasn't close. Sherman shut Crabtree down in the prime of their careers and then cut one of the greatest post-game interviews in sports. But he still never got that handshake. Peyton Manning vs. Mike Vanderjack Before Peyton Manning was a champion and validated as one of the goats of the game, he and Tony Dungy's Colts continually fell short of a Super Bowl after multiple incredible regular seasons. The pressure was mounting, and out of left field came Mike Vanderjack, the Colts' kicker. Yes, the kicker. He had his own theory why they couldn't win the big one. In fact, he had a list of reasons. Manning doesn't show emotion, Dungy was too nice, he couldn't be a good coach, and finally, they lacked the passion to win. Safe to say his criticisms did not go over smoothly. Peyton Manning was at the Pro Bowl and he didn't hold his tongue. I'm out here in Hawaii throwing passes to Jerry Rice, and y'all want to talk about our idiot kicker who got liquored up and ran his mouth. But the beef didn't end with just those comments. Vanderjack was a great kicker, one of the most accurate in the league at the time. But when you come for the sheriff, you better not miss. And that's exactly what Vanderjack did the next year. All it took was one critical missed kick, and Peyton Manning made sure he was on the first plane out. The Colts decided to let Mike walk and instead brought in the greatest kicker in NFL history, Adam Vinatieri. Manning showed that emotion necessary as the Colts won the Super Bowl literally the year after Vander Jack was gone. Joe Montana vs. Steve Young Montana and Young are both Hall of Famers and led the 49ers through their greatest years in franchise history. But between all those glory years is one of the most intense feuds ever. Steve Young arrived in San Francisco in 1987 as a cast-out QB, while Joe Montana had already won two championships with the Niners. However, Bill Walsh secretly told Young that he would be their QB in the future. Montana started the entire 1988 season before the playoffs rolled around. The Niners were getting their teeth kicked in by the Vikings when Walsh surprised everybody by benching Montana for Young. This created a firestorm. Walsh even considered trading Montana that offseason, before deciding to intentionally pit the two against each other the next season. After a horrible start where the two QBs alternated, they chose to stick with Montana, who showed why he was the GOAT at the time. Two Super Bowls later, and not much controversy, Montana was the guy. That is, until 1991. Montana suffered a bad elbow injury that inserted Young as the starter, and he quickly became one of the game's elite. Young won MVP in 92. Finally, the ultimatum? Who was it going to be? Young or Montana? Bill Walsh was no longer the head coach, and the new head coach, George Seifert, wanted Montana. The players were split. Fans had no idea what they wanted. Steve Young just wanted it to end. One of them had to go. Niners fans were completely pissed. Young had just signed a huge deal, and now he was in trade talks. How does a team with four Super Bowl wins go through all this? It all came to an end in one swoop. Montana was traded to the Kansas City Chiefs. It was so bad that Niners fans cheered when Montana scored in their reunion game. Brett Favre vs. Aaron Rodgers At 35 years old, Brett Favre was the king of Green Bay. He was a three-time MVP and world champion. Then the Packers drafted his replacement, a 21-year-old Aaron Rodgers. Whatever way the Pack were expecting Favre to react, he didn't. There was no mentorship. It led us to one of the most Brett Favre quotes of all time. My contract doesn't say I have to get Aaron Rodgers ready to play. Now, hopefully he watches me and gets something from that. Safe to say Favre wasn't ready to give up his mantle just yet, and he was pissed off that the Packers were pushing him out. 
When Rogers and Favre met, Rogers' first words to him were, Good morning, Grandpa. Sheesh. That didn't help the uncomfortable feeling. Rogers was cocky as a rookie and wasn't going to back down. Favre played cruel pranks on Aaron, and Aaron would bring up Favre's poor Wonderlick scores in position meetings. When asked if they hung out, Rogers said, Seriously? I don't even have his number. Favre watched as his entire regime of coaches and players slowly faded away before he retired and gave the reins to Rogers. Until he wanted to unretire, that is. Thankfully, time has healed the beef, and Rogers might even have a bit of understanding for how Favre felt. Looking at you, Jordan Love. Jalen Ramsey vs. Golden Tate Out of all the NFL beefs, this one might be the most personal. Ramsey has a reputation as a brash, trash-talking, and all-around not-nice guy on the football field. Well, he happened to enter the league as the boyfriend of wide receiver Golden Tate's sister, Brianna Tate. Ramsey had two children with Tate's sister before deciding to end the relationship while she was pregnant. It came out that Ramsey left Brianna for a Las Vegas dancer. Ouch. When Golden Tate saw the public image of Ramsey and his new girl together, he replied, He know he gonna have to see me. I'm not happy at all with the disrespect he shown my sister, the way he treated her. It was only a matter of time before the two met on the field. When the Giants played the LA Rams, Ramsey dominated on the field, with a shutdown performance and a hit on Tate that felt just a little personal. But the real moment came after the final whistle of the Rams' 17-9 win, when Tate ran straight up to Ramsey and started a massive brawl. The two had to be separated after the scuffle, leaving the fans wanting more. Safe to say, this beef probably isn't over. Mike Ditka vs. Buddy Ryan Mike Ditka was hired as the Bears' head coach in 1982, and after some convincing from ownership, he kept Buddy Ryan as his defensive coordinator from the last staff. The two never got along, and Ryan did everything he could to beat the living crap out of Ditka's offense in practice. Ryan even acted like the defense was his team and the offense was Ditka's. The offense and defense traveled on separate buses, attended separate meetings, and followed separate codes. Ryan stated, Every now and again, when things weren't going well on the field, Mike would come by and make some suggestions. I'd just tell him to go blank himself, and he'd turn around and walk off. This wasn't just any team, though. During a stretch in the 80s, the Bears won 35 games and lost just three and the 85 Bears defense is widely considered the greatest ever. The rift between the coaches made every practice feel like a game and made the team that much stronger. The night before they won the 85 Super Bowl, Ryan said he was leaving to be the Eagles' head coach, and a rivalry was born. Every time the two teams were slated to play, you would think a championship was on the line. Ditka beat Buddy every time they played, including a divisional round playoff game in 1988 where Fogg covered the field. In post-game press conferences, Ryan would frequently credit the Bears' defense, but never the coaching. When asked about Buddy, Ditka said, He's just jealous. Empty tin cans make the most noise. It got to the point that their players said they should just go to the parking lot and settle it. Aqib Talib vs. Michael Crabtree A beef built around a chain. Aqib Talib was tired and annoyed by a chain. So guess what he did? Rip it right off Michael Crabtree's neck. And that's what started one of the craziest receiver-corner beefs we've ever seen. If he wears it, I'ma snatch it, and I did. He didn't say nothing to me, he just cried to the ref, Talib said. Crabtree didn't want to get kicked out of the game, so he didn't retaliate. You aren't tough, Crabtree responded. A year later, they met again. Even though Talib said he wasn't worried about Crab Boy's chain, as he called him, as soon as they met, Talib snatched it like a man possessed. Crabtree didn't let it slide this time, and it was on. Crabtree drove Tlaib out of bounds before they started throwing haymakers on the Denver sideline. It spilled over, knocking personnel out and players on both sides joined. Just as things looked to get under control, Crabtree and Tlaib found each other again, and we got about seven seconds of a boxing fight. Crabtree connected to Akib's helmet before ducking his punch. The two were immediately ejected from the game and suspended the next. It gave us one of the wildest moments in NFL history. Odell Beckham Jr. vs. Josh Norman Odell Beckham Jr. and Josh Norman simply do not like each other. Norman came into their first meeting wielding a baseball bat in pregame, and that sent the passionate OBJ over the edge. He was out for blood. Every play ended with the two being forcibly separated by officials and other players. Then it became flags thrown, and then it ended up with one of the dirtiest attempts we've seen when OBJ came back 15 yards to spear a defenseless Norman. 
The two combined for five personal foul penalties in the game. Norman felt he cracked the hero image that OBJ had, saying, I hope I pull back a mask, I hope I pull back the face of what dude really is. And OBJ was suspended for his actions. The clash only grew over the offseason, with Odell sending indirect shots at Norman on social media and Norman calling OBJ just OK when asked about him. Odell claimed that Norman was only relevant because of him, to which Norman responded that Odell was only relevant because of a catch. It all got even more interesting when Josh Norman signed to the Giants' rival, Washington. Although the media hyped it up, not much materialized when the two met on the field again. Terrell Owens vs. Donovan McNabb Terrell Owens was brought to the Eagles to give Donovan McNabb a premier target at receiver. What he gave them is one of the weirdest beefs we've ever seen in the NFL. After an electric start, things went south quickly for the Eagles. Two different stories exist for why the beef started. Owens said that McNabb refused to throw to him, and when he asked why, McNabb told him to shut the F up. McNabb said it was about Owens having to be the central figure of everything. Despite all of that, they were able to make the Super Bowl, but fell short after a heroic effort from Owens where he recorded nine receptions for 122 yards just seven weeks after breaking his leg. That offseason, Owens moved into a contract dispute with the Eagles. In an interview, when asked about why he felt he deserved a new contract, he stated, I wasn't the one who got tired in the Super Bowl. A clear shot at McNabb, who multiple teammates have confirmed was so exhausted he puked in the huddle. McNabb told T.O. to keep my name out of your mouth. The beef appeared to be squashed leading into the next season. Owens and McNabb were connecting at a prolific rate through the first seven games. Then, in a somewhat random interview, Terrell Owens expressed how he was upset that the Eagles didn't celebrate his 100th touchdown catch. And when asked if his team would be undefeated if Brett Favre was the quarterback, Owens said, I mean, uh, that's a good assessment. I would agree with that. That interview came out the same week he got into a fight with teammate Hugh Douglas. The Eagles suspended T.O. and demanded he give an apology. Owens decided to leave McNabb out of his list of people he felt he needed to say sorry to. After serving his four-game suspension, Owens came back, decided to bite his tongue, and apologized to McNabb. Donovan took it as a slap in the face, a disingenuous apology. It was the end of the T.O. era. He was terminated. McNabb did not hold back on T.O. now that he was not part of the team anymore, calling him a locker room cancer. The two, to this day, have never had anything good to say about each other. We'll never talk about their ability on the field, just the fracture they created off the field and their infamy as one of the craziest beefs in NFL history.